Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real-life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. Hello and welcome to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and with me today is Raoul Mudgal. He is many things. He's the director and partner at Parvis Asset Management, a company he's worked at in several roles for over 18 years now. And during his career, he's held dozens of advisory and consulting roles for companies as varied as TT International, GuidePoint and Mitsubishi as well as trustee roles with charities, including the British Exploring Society. So, Raul, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. Morning. So, consultant, manager, advisor, director, and many more things. Why don't we start with what stage is your career at now? I feel like I'm just getting going, Mark, to be honest. I think the more I do, the more I want to do, and I just get excited. And I always think about ideas and opportunities. So, I don't think I'm anywhere near kind of my peak really, and no honesty. I just get more excited about things I see, people I meet. So my brain's always ticking, really. But I've been working for a long time. So the title asset management, I think to a lot of people, it seems a strange world inhabited by perhaps very wealthy people making a lot of money. But what do asset managers actually do, first of all? And secondly, what good is that to everybody else? So it's a really good question. And actually, with one of the charities I work with, Gain, Girls Are Investors, we try and educate young women about asset management, what it is, why it's important, things like that. So asset management is where firms have responsibility for managing assets of organizations, things like pension funds, university endowments, corporations, sometimes governments as well. So those organizations, those institutions have a pool of assets and they invest those assets with a view to making money, either for, you know, let's say retired teachers or for a government or for a university. It could be any sort of pool of money. And even families do that as well. They say, we have this pool of money. We want to invest it for long term so that we can sustain our family's wealth, generational wealth. We can build up our pension fund so all our retirees can get paid. So that's really what asset management is. It's effectively investing money on behalf of institutions. And with it becomes a huge responsibility. Now, asset management is seen as a dirty, evil thing because we have the word money involved in it. But people don't realize how much philanthropy is involved, for example in asset management, in the firms I work with, there's a huge amount of philanthropy. These people, yes, they make money, but a lot of them come from underprivileged backgrounds. They've built up a, a life of resilience where they really, really able to take the knocks that come with being in the market, but they also give a lot back and the industry actually is encouraging more and more people to sign up to various pledges and also get involved in different charities. Huge contributor to tax revenues for the country as well. You know, on the back of that, we can do a lot of things as a country for people who are less fortunate. And actually, I think it empowers people who build up their careers, they're able to sort of contribute to their family life, give their kids a good quality of life, get access to opportunities and things they may not have. So there's a lot of positive things that come out of it, for sure. So all the teachers in the UK, all the nurses as well, who are contributing on a monthly basis towards their own pensions, that huge pot of money is effectively the responsibility of, of you or somebody like you as an asset manager. And those pensions, as they say in the advert, those can go up or down in terms of value. When they go up and down, do the earnings of people who are asset managers, do they go up and down? 100%. So we're very correlated to what happens with the market and what happens to our performance. So if you're a teacher or a nurse, you get paid a consistent amount regularly every month, every year, you know what you're going to do with us. If the market does well and we do well, we get paid well. If we have a terrible time and we lose money, our earnings go down. So we're correlated directly with how we do and how the market's performing. And so in the actual day-to-day -day of doing this job, especially over the last few years with markets being affected by everything from COVID, war in Ukraine, Brexit prior to that, there's been a lot of turbulence in those markets. How do you on a day-by-day -day basis, actually go about doing your job and making the decisions you need to push up the value of those pensions? So for me, I'm not on the investment side, but I'm on the business side. So I build organizations. So my role is to look after all of our clients and to win new clients and then sort of make sure all the middle and back office is ticking over. Okay. So our operations, our finance, 
compliance, IT, things like that. I have oversight over all of those to make sure they're running because in all honesty, you've got to think about it like a building that has heating and water and things like that. If those things don't work, then the whole building won't work. So effectively that's, I'm like the caretaker. So I oversee all of that stuff. It's been a really interesting few years. So the firm I work with are very, very contrarian. I think kind of like I am as a person. So people think, oh my goodness, all these terrible things, COVID's happened, Ukraine's happened, Brexit's happened. But we as a firm think that those are actually opportunities. So it's kind of how I think about life. Wherever a door shuts, a window opens. So that's kind of how we think about things. So when people hear of these sort of headline things, they run away. But we have very long duration capital. So we invest for a very long period of time. So our clients commit for us for an initial period of three to seven years. So for three to seven years, they buy into what we do and let us get on with it. So we do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. That's it's just who we are, what we do. And that's really how you generate returns or what we call alpha, i.e. you beat what the market's doing. So we always try and do the opposite of what everyone's doing. Because if you're doing what everyone else is doing, then you just become part of the crowd and it's harder to distinguish who you are as a person. So ironically, the firm I work with, I actually believe reflects who I am as a person as well. And I guess other listeners who have pensions would probably want to know that the people looking after those have some experience, some knowledge, maybe some qualifications, at least they know what they're doing. How does somebody get to become an asset manager and get to become the person who takes my pension and hopefully grows it? Well, I think in the eighties, this whole industry became quite democratized. Kind of, there was a whole wave of reform that came in. So it was, became accessible to everyone. But the reality is over time, if you're good and you're talented and you're ethical and you do things the right way, you'll be sustainable. And then if you're sustainable, you're going to attract the right, you'll get the right opportunities and the right clients. So you're able to there really make, make a stance. So it's all about, I always think about life as durational execution. So if you're in it for the long term and you learn and you're calm and you slow and you're slow and thoughtful, you're more likely to sustain. If you're quick and you think short term, it's going to be harder for you to sustain because the danger is if you're short and quick, you're going to be thinking about what's happening in the next two minutes, five minutes. So I honestly believe that there's a correlation with being longer term, thinking longer term, you know, dealing with pain, learning. That's really effectively how we invest as a firm as well. It's not easy to get into, to be at top level. I'll say, I said at the basic level, most people can get access to this industry. The question is where you want to go and what you want to do. If you want to become good and part of the great network of high quality firms that do good things, that manage great organizations, capital, then that's harder to get to, but it's blood, sweat and tears like it is for everything really. And what do you think therefore makes the difference between somebody who enters this world, who's good and somebody who's great? What are the skills or attributes that define the people who make it to the top? That's a really good question, Mark. And I think most people are good. I think what's great is the people who are always hungry, always learning. This is the most dynamic industry. If you think the world is changing every day, the economy is changing every day, you have to have the ability to be flexible and dynamic. So you're constantly innovating. What's amazing about this industry, there's constantly changes in regulations, in ideas, in things that are going on in the economy, in political legislation, all sorts of things. So people who are able to adapt and, you know, respond to those changes are going to succeed. Number one, number two, if you're dynamic, creative, energetic, then you can keep pace with that. I think you'll do well. Number three, and it's a big thing today, I think, which is really, really, you can see it everywhere that you go is having pride in your work having pride in what you do, really caring, because I think that's really what distinguishes who you are. And that's what makes changes you from being good to being great, where you, you really, really think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. And then I think just having a long-term time horizon, you know, there's many studies that have shown if you give a kid a sweet and you put it in front of them and say, if you wait half an hour, I'll give you another one, right? They get rewarded for, for being patient. Whereas if they take that suite right now, it's instant gratification and they're like, I want another one. So I always think being good, yes, go for instant gratification, being great, think long term. So invest in what you're doing, invest in yourself. And I think that's really what is the difference between good and great. So you mentioned also in there about constantly learning. 
And I think that you've attended in some form well over 15 different universities across three or four continents. And how have you managed to pack in that amount of self-development of learning alongside the hard graph that it's required to progress in your career? So I always, if everyone's going left, I'm always going right. So I always wanted to sort of go to university and learn. When you think about university, everyone thinks about academic learning. I think about life learning as well. I went to study in Russia, Japan, the US and the UK. And I will never, ever forget the skills that I got from being abroad in another country where one of the universities I went to in Russia, Moscow State University, you're in a dorm with 200 people. The only common language is Japanese, sorry, is Russian. My roommate was Japanese and the other two guys who shared our apartment were from Morocco. So the only language we all had together was Russian, but it just really teaches you about no matter who you are, what you achieve, what you do, communications is the number one skill that everyone needs to have. If you have the ability to communicate, you have the ability to build relationships. And to me, life is about relationships. That's really what it's about. So we would have this wall and we'd get a word and we'd translate it from Russian into English, Japanese and Arabic. And it was just amazing. I learned so much, just simple things like that. When you have to go to a shop and buy some bread or buy a bottle of water or anything, if you don't know the language, you're just, you're not going to be able to drink any water. You're not going to be able to buy any bread. So you just have to get on and do it. And, you know, I had some very tough experiences while I was out there. Believe me, the first night I went out there, I cried myself to sleep because I went to sleep and there was all these cockroaches crawling on my wall. And I thought, what have I done? Why have I decided to come here of all the places that I could have gone to? But it just builds such resilience. And I had one of the best times of my life. I made some of the best friends I've ever made because when you're going through those experiences with other people, it really bonds you really does. And so you've neatly taken us back a couple of decades to when you were, not quite when you were starting out, but early in your career, but, but take it back right to the beginning in terms of, were you thinking when you were 16, 18, 21, I want to work in asset management? What was your thought and ambitions right at the beginning? You know, it's so interesting. I think when I, got, when I think about my teenage years, I kind of can't even remember what I was thinking about what I wanted to do where I wanted to be or anything. I kind of was just existing. And then when we were kids, we went on holiday. Her mum and dad us to a different country every year. We'd drive because mum was scared of flying and my parents didn't have much money. So we went to Switzerland and we went to the League of Nations. And, you know, obviously it's not League of Nations. That was United Nations building, but League of Nations originally headquartered there. We saw all these international institutions and I just became fascinated with it. And over time I was like, I'd love to be a diplomat. That's, I've really, really, I just sort of, you interact with people, you're resolving problems, you're learning about different cultures. And I thought, I really want to do this. And dad and I had discussions for years about it. And I, but I just put it along at school. I was, you know, I was fine. I was, you know, had a good time. I had the best years of my life at school and really, really got into it. In those days you had PCAS and UCA. So you could apply for polytechnic or for university because we had two levels of system. And at school, I was told you can't apply for university. You're not smart enough. So I applied for polytechnic. I was predicted all Easter at use for my A-levels. And I just, I don't know what happened. It's kind of someone lit a fire under me and said, you can't just accept this. So I applied for Polytechnic. I got into one of the four that I applied for on a conditional offer. And I just worked so, so hard for my A-levels. And I got A's and B's to everyone's surprise. And I thought, what do I want to do? And I thought, I really am going to go for this diplomatic thing. And I wanted to be somewhere completely different to London because I've been in London my whole life. A lot of people from all over the world, crowded, crazy, busy, amazing energy, but I wanted to go somewhere that's completely opposite. So I actually went to a tiny university at that time. It was very small, 3000 students in the middle of nowhere called Keel, K-E-E-L-E, -E -E, middle of Staffordshire. Everyone lived on campus, did international relations, had the time of my life and actually got through that to work with the United Nations Association through work experience because Keel had a unique relationship with the United Nations Association. And then through that, got work experience for the United Nations itself. What that did, unfortunately, is completely killed my desire to work for the United Nations. Cause I just, I was really disheartened because I really felt a lot of the people that were there. And I know it's not true, but a lot of the people that I met certainly were focused on themselves and not on the mission. And I thought, I don't want to be in this environment. I'd love studying. So then I went on and did a master's at Cambridge, then went to LSU, started a PhD program. I thought this academia thing's for me. I really went into it. But then I soon realized it wasn't for me. <laughs> so 
In the meantime, my old university, Kiel, asked me to go back and teach. So I taught, did that for four years. And then with the PhD course I was doing, I got pulled into a British government project, which was connected to my PhD, which is focused around development in the Asia Pacific region, particularly the Russian Far East, which is what I was a specialist in and its relationship with different countries in Asia. My specialism was Japan. So that's why I got to go out to university in Japan and Russia. And then the top specialists in the world were in the U S so I got to go to university of Hawaii, university of Washington, Harvard, University of Illinois, over to Champaign, you know, all these cornfields in the middle of Illinois. So I had the most amazing experience, but you know, Mark, in the end, I thought this is great, but it's just not enough because being an academic is amazing. The greatest satisfaction when someone comes to you and says, I don't understand this and they walk away and they're understanding it. I cannot tell you what satisfaction it gives you. It's literally like teaching your child to walk. And then I just, I thought, what do I want to do with my life? And I literally took a moment and stepped back and this was the summer of 1998, so 25 years ago. And I applied for tons and tons of jobs. I mean, you name it, management consultancy, asset management, marketing roles, strategy roles. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I applied for loads and loads of jobs. And I got an interview with three or four firms, but this one firm I got an interview with, the guy was called Mark. He's my mentor still today. And he's an asset manager. And I walked into this room. I had no idea what an equity is, what an equity was, what asset management was, what anything it was. I just really liked the idea of what they were doing because they were kind of thinking about the world and connecting politics and economics together. And they wanted someone to look after their client. So I went in, sat there, had a great conversation with Mark. He messaged me that evening, said, I really like you. Can you come back? Through a series of 16 meetings, which included two lunches and also having to write a piece, I got that job. And I later found out, he told me when we went for a cup of tea after I got the job, he said, Rahul, 2000 people applied for that job when you got it. And my brain just exploded. And I thought, how on earth did that happen? And I did say to him, how did that happen? And he said, I don't know if you remember Rahul, you sent your resume in on orange paper and I had a pile of resumes this big. And they're all white paper. And in the middle, there was this resume on orange paper. And I thought, whoever's got the guts to send the resume on orange paper, I have to have a look. And it was really, I think the start of me thinking, taking the less trodden path, taking a different route is always the way where you go from not from being good to being great. You really make your mark. And I think that's really what it's about for the right reasons. I did it by accident, Mark, in all honesty, I'd run out of white paper. <laughs> And I had orange paper. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to do this because I was applying for so many jobs. You know, you get to that point in your life where you're like, right, I just have to send up my CV to everything and anything and see what happens and take my chances. And so that was the start of the left field path, really. So after spending most of your 20s in academia all over the world, you then entered a more commercial career. And since that point, how smooth or how rocky has the career journey been for you? From the outside, most people think it's been smooth. It hasn't been smooth. It's been tough, but I, you know, you don't appreciate things until you've been through them. Okay. When you've had a tough time, you're in the middle of it. And it's kind of like you're, you're sailing through a storm and you just want the storm to go. And you know, I joke with people, I have bullet holes from the tough times, but you know what? It makes you who you are. It makes you resilient. It makes you better at dealing with those things. The more you deal with them, the more you're able to tolerate them. The more you sort of experience that this is part of what this world is and every job, whether you're a teacher, a nurse, a painter, decorator, a taxi driver, an asset manager, the prime minister, everyone has good and bad days. Everyone. It's just that some of those jobs are considered more high profile, more important, whatever. They're all important that we can't function as a country unless everyone does those things. But I think you don't realize the things that make you until you've gone through them and the things that make you are the tough days and the tough times. You're going to be given opportunities and you're not going to get them because someone else is better than you, or it's just not the right time. You're going to want to do things and someone's going to stop you from doing them. You're not going to get credit for things that you've done and someone's going to else is going to get credit. I think you just have to realize that that's how life is. But the key thing is it should never, ever crush who you are because every person goes through that. And for me, that's the thing that I always think about every day that every experience that you have, no one can take that from you, right? Whether it's good or bad, that's your journey. And that's the thing that makes you who you are. And so I always think about everything that I go through, right? Why is this happening? It always happens for a reason. It always happens for a reason. 
So, you know, the first time I worked at when I joined, it was very small and it went from this to this overnight, but because I didn't have enough experience, the glass ceiling came over. And so they bought in more senior people. So I knew when I joined that firm, I really thought I was going to be the whole of my life because I just loved it. I was so excited about the opportunities, the people I was working with and everything, but it became apparent at some point I was going to have to move on. So I was sad about that, but actually, you know what? It was a great thing. And I had to just sort of grab the ball by the horns and move it. When I left, I made the worst career decision I've ever made. I went to work for a place. It was this, the complete antithesis of everything I believe in, my values, culture, everything that I would want to do and be part of was a complete opposite. And so within six months, I actually resigned. I knew within three months, I wasn't going to be there for seven years like I was at TT, but I still made some great friends. I learned a lot that really led me to really say, what do I want to do? Who do I want to be? After that, I had probably the best job I have ever had until, you know, where I am now, where I learned so much. And, you know, someone at the time who was the best hedge fund, most best hedge fund guy, most high profile fund in the world and took a chance on me. I was the guy who was just in the background and he pushed me to the front and I had the time of my life. And had four and a half incredible years. And then at the end, it became tough. Again, we started to hit the global financial crisis. I had to take a lot of punches and deal with a lot of things. But again, I'll never forget that time, but it just taught me so much. Again, it went back down to relationships and human interaction. And I still come back to that point every time. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, where you are, what you've achieved, your ability to interact with humans is just the number one skill. You have that, you can do anything. Just going back then to the job that was completely wrong for you, the one that you left after six months, you said you learned so much doing that particular role. Can you be more specific about what you think that gave you that you didn't have when you started that role? Do you know, Mark, is that, that's a really good question. I think what it gave me is focus. Because I'd gone from this great firm, which I kind of outgrown, And I didn't know what I wanted to do. The first thing I thought is I need to get out of here and try and think about my next career. What I really did is take a sidestep. But you know, that sidestep was kind of someone whacking me in the face going, hold on, what are you doing? And I went there and I thought, this is just not me. It's just not what I want to do. What I want to do is really take charge of something, build something, learn on the job. Because quite often we're all scared of taking chances and over-prepared for things, but someone takes a chance on you and you think, okay, I'm going to grab the bull by the horns and just learn by doing it. So it really made me really hungry and really determined. When this opportunity came to me, I got a call out of the blue. I only from a headhunter called me the year before I'd taken the job that I didn't want to take and said, look, how's it going? I said, I hate it. He said, right. There's an amazing role that's come up. And then I'm sending the job description. Send the job description. I went, that's my dream job because it was building something. It was having responsibility, but he didn't tell me who it was for because what he wanted to do, and I respect him so much for this. He wanted me to want the job for what it was, not the job for the firm that it was. So he's really thoughtful about it. So I met him for a coffee and then he told me it was, well, I'm never getting that job because he said, no, I think you're going to get that job. And I said, really? And I went for an interview, then another one and yeah, the rest is history. But it just, sometimes I think, you know, there's a Chinese saying, the brightest moments come after the darkest times, right? So when you think about daylight, the darkest time of the night is right before the sun rises, right? And so I think that's literally what happened to me. I went to this dark place. I completely lost my confidence. I questioned my abilities and everything. I just thought, where's this going? What am I going to do with my life? Because everything that I'd learned and was excited about and thought I brought with me, it kind of evaporated in six months. I can empathize with that a lot. I think for me too, some of the brightest parts of my varied career journey have come after some of the darkest ones. And that's partly because they just seem brighter by comparison, but also partly because after the darker ones, you say, actually, I need to do something here. And so you put an extra effort, a little more adrenaline, a little more focus, and then that can really lift you. So I think a lot of people will understand that. And Apart also then from circumstances that have been around you. So if you take a job in the wrong company, you need to do something about it. What about bad circumstances that have been your responsibility? So where along the way do you think, you know, I made a mistake then? What was the mistake and what did you do about it? So I think the mistake was just wanting to leave my first firm. 
because I felt I'd outgrown it rather than waiting for the right opportunity. I was like, I need to go now. Not because I love the people. I'm still friends with all of that set of people I met during that time. But I just kind of was, right, I need to just get out and make a change. And it, again, it was thinking short term. I was like, right, short term, I just need to get out. If I'd thought longer term about it, I probably would have waited for the right opportunity to come. So again, it, that, so that for me, I took a short term view. I thought quickly. I got out. Reality is I was offered a job that was going to be A, B, and C, but it turned out to be X, Y, and Z, including my compensation. So everything about it was just an illusion, really, shall we say. But it just makes you focus. It makes you think. It makes you realize if you make decisions too quickly, they can often be the wrong ones. And it also made me pay attention to detail a lot more. So some of the things that didn't manifest themselves, the signs were there, but I didn't read them because I just chose to ignore them. So you, when you reflect on these things, you kind of say, these red flags do come up. It's kind of like someone saying, warning, warning, but sometimes we just choose to ignore those. So that was my fault. And I made a mistake of doing that. And I make mistakes all the time, Mark. What, what happens, I think, as you progress in your life and your career, when you realize make a mistake is all right, as long as it's not detrimental to anyone else, it's just detrimental to yourself. It's fine. You learn from it, then you become a better person. So I think there's this big fear, particularly in our culture today, where people are scared to make mistakes. But the reality is you don't grow and develop as a person unless you make mistakes. And I make mistakes every day, whether it's right, typing the wrong day or, you know, taking the wrong train, whatever it may be, there's always something, but it doesn't matter because it's not affecting anyone else. So I think those are the things that I really learned that when you make a mistake, step back and reflect it. When I had my kids, the woman who is our antenatal teacher gave me the best bit of advice. And I use that for life now. She said, when you're a parent, you tend to react to things very, very quickly because you're panicked and it's your kid and you're responsible for them. The reality is if you take a step back, you need to do three things before you do anything. You need to breathe again, and then you need to think about what you're going to do. And I now apply that to life because I think it's very easy for us to say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And you do X, Y, and Z, then you realize that was the wrong decision to make. So it's being slower and being more thoughtful. So you've, you've spoken a lot about people and relationships, particularly you mentioned an early mentor of yours called Mark. Perhaps could ask you to elaborate a little bit on what he as a mentor brought to your life, his approach to it. Was he consciously mentoring you? more subconscious. So what value did he play for you? So ironically, yesterday I sent Mark some of his favorite wine and some scenes of his favorite artists, because I said, Mark, 25 years ago, you took a chance on me and you changed my life. And Mark didn't intentionally, I think, realize what an impact he'd made on my life. And today I don't think he realizes either, but I still reflect back to him, the kind of one liners of mission of value of integrity, all the things that he taught me. I still hold true today. You know, the best thing he ever told me is never be an asshole. You meet everyone twice. It's the best advice I've ever, ever gotten, especially in my industry. And I think it's probably true for most industries. Most industries are actually quite small where, you know, a lot of people know each other or they know of each other. In certain industry that I work in, if you're not a good person, or you're a bad actor, everyone's going to know about you. And the people that I met at the beginning of my career, are still the people I work with today, a lot of them, because they were junior and I was junior and we kind of grown up together and we've got to work together, but it's just respecting them for who they are and always, you know, having that conversation. And I think people think about people in terms of the roles that they have rather than the people that they are. And I think if you think about people as in who they are, then those relationships transcend organization. It doesn't matter where they are or what their role is. They're human beings. So for me, that's always been really important. So. You know, never be an ass with me, everyone twice always said to me, if we lose a client because of bad performance, that's one thing. It's absolutely unacceptable to lose a client because you've done a bad job and not looked after them. He was the one who really kicked me into gear in terms of focus and attention to detail. You know, we went from this small firm to this huge firm and he would give me such a hard time, not because he was a bad guy, because he wanted me to be amazing at what I did and everything that I did, he read it, he corrected it, whatever. And when that's my boot camp, it was amazing, but it was exactly what I needed to make sure that I focused, I paid attention to the detail. And it's that attention to detail when you remember things about people, when you give them what they really want, when you've listened to what they've said, that changes that dynamic and that relationship. Again, that's a going from good to becoming great. Be patient, 
be long term, you know, all those things that I still hold true today. And do you think there are people around today who would describe you as their mentor? So I've got out of my way to mentor people for sure. And I've, and it's an honor. I don't ever think of it like that. I just think that when you've been given opportunities and, you know, you've had a good career, I think you have a responsibility to send the elevator back down and to help people. And it, you, we've all been there. We've all sort of aspired to make contact or be in someone's sphere that we've looked up to or admired. And half the times they don't care. They want to know who you are. They don't respond to your messages. That's fine, but you kind of think if someone reaches out to you, you don't have to have a lifetime relationship with them. But you know, unless they're a pain, you know, why wouldn't you take a chance? Say, okay, I'm going to see what I can do to help them. I think you should do that. I think everyone should do that, and the world would be a better place. Also, it sort of cleared the clouds over all these kind of illusions or visions or ideas of what people think certain things are. If people went out and talked about asset management or nursing or teaching or bus driving or law, law and explain what they did, then it would help people, right? And it'd help people make better decisions. It would give people access to information that you just can't find anywhere. Talking to someone about what they do is going to, you know, outshine, wipe out anything that you can read about anything. Because the reality is what you read is just what you read. When you get opinions from people who've been through stuff, then you're like, wow, this is really what I'm, I'm getting an insight into something that I never would get from anywhere else. Hopefully, at Careers Unwrapped, without you giving us an advert yourself, Thorell, that's a bit of what we're trying to do here by showing in a little more depth what different career routes, different pathways are like, and give people a bit of light, a few ideas and insights that they can use. One thing I'm interested in, especially in the context of mentoring, perhaps, is you've spent time in Japan, you spent time in Russia, you spent time in the UK and the States, amongst others. But have you seen a difference in those countries and those cultures about their approach to mentoring and supporting people on their career journeys? Massively. I think the first thing you have to do is you have to respect every country's ways and culture and the way they do stuff. And I think that's what makes traveling interesting because you learn people do the same thing in different ways. It's amazing and it's continues to evolve because I think the whole influence of social media, of AI, that's... It's changing how people interact with each other and also how people gather and find information. In a way, we've got too much information. So for me, I say it time and time again when I speak to you, are you going more digital in terms of what you're doing? No, I'm going the other way. Everyone's going digital, I'm going analog. Because the reality is nothing can replace human relationships, communication, conversations, experience, and things like that. So the more that people try and find information digitally, build relationships digitally, I'm going the other way. So. The only thing I'm on is LinkedIn. I'm not on any Facebook or Twitter or, you know, Instagram or anything like that. I just kind of feel when you build relationships with people, you learn directly from them and you can speak to them about their experiences. And particularly, you get much more of a variety. When you go to social media, you tend to try and find people who agree with how you think, or you tend to find a crowd that kind of is the majority. But when you speak to people, you're like, wow, that guy did that way. And you can kind of mix, mix it up. I always think about it. Everyone says to me, what do you read every week? I said, what I read every week is different. They're like, what? I said, because the danger is if you read the same journal or publication every week, it's going to brainwash how you think. But if you read a different thing every time, you get different opinions. The same way I sort of think about people interaction. You meet different people, you meet different cultures, you go to different places, you get different influences, and you can take almost the best bits of each of them, right? So when I went to Russia, you know, all our exams were verbal. Right. So from a cultural perspective, that was fascinating because you had to know your stuff. You had to talk about it. In Japan, what I loved was kind of how everything that everyone does is for the greater good. The self is the last part of what you do. You always think about what's the right for my community? What can I give back? Everyone has such pride in what they do. So that was amazing. In the US, the kind of entrepreneurial spirit, the energy, the enthusiasm to learn, to think about everything it has been amazing. And the UK kind of the history that we have and, you know, how people are so proud of, you know, the UK and it's home to sort of so many cultures, you know, you take all these different bits from all these different places. And, you know, I think it makes you who you are really. And the negative side of people at times, did you find that there were people who put barriers in your way because of any personal opinion they might have had right or wrong because of any viewpoints? Did you find and how did you overcome the barriers put in place by other people. 
I sometimes I'm a bit blindsided because I just don't see, I'm always trying to see the good in people. Honestly, I know now in my industry, kind of there's good and bad players, but I always try and think about that's fine. If they want to be like that, it doesn't matter. I'll move on. I think the job that I had in the middle, the place that was there, because there were definitely a lot of barriers there. You had to fit a certain identity and a certain background to sort of be able to sort of get ahead. I knew it was never going to be me. And also I don't want to get a job because I fit a certain criteria. I want to get it because I'm the best person for it. So for me, that kind of makes me more determined. The same thing when I go back to thinking about, I wasn't allowed to apply to university, I was only allowed to apply to polytechnic. They may say, well, who's going to tell me that? The worst thing I can do is not achieve it, but I'm not going to sit here and just take it because someone's told me I can't do that. I'm going to just do my best. And I know when I look back on my life, I tried because the worst thing you can do is not try. So if someone puts up a barrier in front of me, I'm just going to try my best to knock it down. But again, I'm also a bit of a fatalist and I believe that everything happens for a reason. So sometimes things are just not meant to be. And you have to realize that it's just not going to be no matter how hard you try or whatever you do. It doesn't matter. You get to a point like, right, I'm going to take a different path. I'm going to do something different. I never thought I'd have two careers, you know, be an academic and then do finance. It's brilliant and I'm lucky. So I think all these barriers that come up, you either have to take a mindset, okay, I'm either going to take a different path or I'm going to just try and overcome them. And the pattern builds up when you, when you hit barriers, you think, okay, I'm in that barrier again. Looking ahead. In your particular sector at the moment, what do you think are the future trends, changes and challenges that those entering asset management or the wider finance sector are going to find over the next five or 10 years? So I think those entering are going to be entering a much more turbulent part of the market. There's a great sort of connectivity between politics and economics than there has ever been. All the things which we took for granted for 40, 50 years are being turned upside down right now. And that's going to affect the world and also affect the economy, which are going to affect markets. I think that there's going to be more regulations. And I think at the same time, there's going to be more opportunities because I think there is this whole move to sort of democratize finance. They're now having a lot of, you know, mum and pops enter finance, do their own things, get interested in it, try and make money themselves, particularly in the US. So there's a huge movement now where people are going to be able to get access to finance that have not been able to get access to. The question is where you want to be. The spectrum is greater than it has ever been. You know, you can be, join an asset manager, you can join a bank, you can join a hedge fund, you can join, you know, any sort of financial institution. The question is, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be a relationship person? Do you want to be a finance person? Do you want to manage money? So the opportunities are huge. You can do anything you want in this industry. We have to stay ahead of the times and be dynamic because it's constantly evolving. I think that's the exciting bit about it. With a lot of industries, when regulation comes in, those are the rules. But this industry continues to adapt, modify, and find ways around that. And also adapt, modify to the environment that we're in and to the opportunities that are out there. And so if you could get face-to-face with perhaps your 18 or 21-year-old self, with the hindsight and experience you have now, what advice would you pass back through time to them? I think the first thing I'd say is slow down because I think everyone's in a rush and sometimes when you rush, things go wrong and it's fine. Things are going to go wrong, but I think be more thoughtful. That's the first thing. Secondly, always just be open to everything and anything because you just don't know what's around the corner. You just don't know what's around the corner. Some of the best opportunities and ideas have come when I've least expected it. And sometimes where I had hope. I thought things were going to work out. They didn't work out. So you just never, ever know what's around the corner. And it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And I think you've just got to keep on moving forward and realize this isn't meant to be. I've got to go and find another thing. I think the third thing is, and I think it's something that it's taken me quite a bit of time to sort of realize is separate, you know, the emotional from the practical. Because sometimes you can get very emotional about things where you just, you shouldn't, you need to be pragmatic and rational about it. And there's times where you need to be emotional when you're not, you're very pragmatic. So it's just learning to separate those two. And it's hard because we're all human beings. And sometimes you have to realize what's important that you need to spend time and energy on and what's not important. And that's where you split the two. I think I was emotional about everything. I'm still quite emotional about things, but you sometimes get to point like, right, it doesn't matter. You've got to move on. And now I've got kids, you've got to have to think about, you know, what you do and how you think about things and how it affects them. 
So, you know, if your kid falls over, do you run and start going, oh my goodness, or just say, all right, come on, get up. I think the latter, right? Because you don't want them to sort of be, you know, make that fall over a thing that turns them to an emotional wreck and that every time they fall over, they're going to get upset. Of course, there are times they fall over, they really do hurt themselves. So it's about distinguishing what's important and what's not. So I would say all those things and just keep learning, just keep learning. You just never, ever know what information you're going to find out next day. So I think, Raoul, this has been fascinating. There's so much to unpick from even this short discussion and so much to, to think about from a fascinating career journey that, as you said right at the beginning, still has a long way to go. And who knows what sort of twists and turns will be ahead. But I've, I've really picked up from this the three sort of key points I felt you said earlier on, which is be adaptable, be creative, take pride in your work, and also underpin all of that by really strong human relationships and through constant lifelong learning. And you have certainly pushed the boundaries of lifelong learning. Now, one of the things we often like to ask is, who else should we get on here? We want to keep passing this baton of careers experience along. So who else should we be trying to unwrap the career of that would be helpful to, to listeners and viewers? The person that springs to mind is a guy called Darren Alloway. And I met Darren through someone who used to be a client of mine, who is one of the largest private donors to education in the US. And he plucked this, this young kid from East London, who was an incredible basketball player and paid for him to go to Stanford. And today Darren runs the family office business for Europe, the Middle East and Africa in the family offices at Goldman Sachs, just an incredible guy who's literally come from nothing and got the best opportunity of his life to go to Stanford and today is doing amazing things. Sounds really interesting. Sounds like someone we definitely want to speak to. So Raul, thank you so much for joining us to unwrap your career journey. It's been really interesting. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.